Well, hello everyone. Um, my name's Stan Steindl. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist uh, just in private practice, but one of my areas of interest is this topic of motivational interviewing. So hopefully for the, for the next little while we'll have a bit of a chat about um, motivational interviewing and perhaps how it might be um, useful for you uh, in some of the work that you do with your clients and patients. I suppose just to, to set the scene, one of the, the most satisfying things I think about our work as clinicians um, is helping people to make changes to their lives which um, actually uh, helps to improve their health and perhaps improve their quality of life. In fact, it's quite a privileged position I think in many ways for us to, to be able to, to have that sort of involvement in, in people's lives. On the other hand, I think one of the most challenging things about our work as clinicians and, um, is in fact helping people make changes to their lives. <laughs> one of the most challenging things is what to do to actually help people to make decisions about their lifestyle and their behaviours that does uh, help them to improve their health and their quality of life. It's, it's important because um, two of the largest contributors to people's health outcomes and, and perhaps to their poor health is in fact their lifestyle choices. Um, and secondly, their choices around whether they adhere to and follow through with different treatment uh, recommendations as well. So lifestyle behaviours and treatment adherence are, are two of the big contributors to, to people's health outcomes. The way we communicate with patients is also then very important in terms of the choices that, that people make and their ability to, to make and sustain those behavioural changes. So today will be a bit about that notion of how we communicate with our clients or patients. In fact, we hold a very unique position, I think, and, and a, and a new, unique um, sort of opportunity to uh, work with people in a way that prepares them for change. What I'd like to do first of all though is just to, um, just to show you an example of an interaction between a clinician and a patient. Have a think about it as I, as I talk through it because there's some things that, that the interaction actually kind of demonstrates in the way that, that, um, that clinicians and patients can, can, uh, can work together. So looking at your BMI and your consistently high blood pressure readings, now's a good time for you to start exercising and losing some weight. Yeah. Um, you know, I get up early with the kids and I'm at work till 7 or 8 p.m. so I don't have a lot of time during the day. I understand time is scarce but this is very serious. There's a high risk association between high blood pressure and risk of stroke. Yeah, uh, I've heard that but I feel guilty spending time on myself when I should be spending it with the family. I know it's hard to juggle everything, but if you don't spend the time now working on your health, you're not going to be there long term for your family. Yeah, but I've never been a good exerciser and I've never really enjoyed it. You know, I'd rather read and relax with a couple of good reds. That's the best end of day for me. Okay, it's important to relax at the end of the day, but keep in mind alcohol can increase your blood pressure as well, so you may need to watch how much you drink as well. Yeah, but, you know, I've heard that. So what's happening in that sort of interaction? Well, well what we see there is a concerned clinician. You know, here is a, a clinician who really would like to help the person and, and to prevent um, bad things happening to that person. And the, the clinician is showing good skills. There, there's good communication skills, good good um, uh, kind of reflections of some of the harder bits that the patient is experiencing. And the clinician in amongst that is offering logical arguments for change. They're presenting the reasons that the person should change. Um, the only problem is the patient is arguing back. The patient is arguing against change. There's, it's becoming this interaction between the two whereby um, the clinician on the one hand is, is trying to put all of those good arguments for why the client should change out there and the, the client is arguing against those reasons. He's putting all the reasons why they can't or shouldn't or won't change. They've, there's a little bit of, a, of an interaction that we often see in that situation where each person is kind of starting their sentence with yes but. Maybe you should make this change. Yeah, but I can't because of this. Yeah, but maybe you should because of this. Yeah, but I can't because of this. And that yes, but sort of tennis, in a way, is actually creating um, an argument. It's friendly and nice and pleasant, but nevertheless, it's an argument and the, the client is arguing against change. 
the really important thing for us as clinicians to stop and consider as well though is that there's something in what the clinician or we as clinicians are doing that's actually evoking that from the client. And that's really important because we know that um, the more that we evoke arguments against change from the client, the less likely that they actually will change. So in an interaction like that, the, the clinician and the clinician's behaviours are actually reducing the likelihood of, of the client actually making any of the changes that, that ultimately might be important for them. So I suppose the, the, the question is, is you know, really, what's at play here? And, and the thing that we have to remember when we're working with people who are um, considering change or perhaps feel two ways about some sort of behaviour is, is we need to remember that ambivalence is the key dilemma that they face. They feel two ways about it. There are good things and not so good things about any given behaviour, whether it's something like um, you know, exercise or, you know, or, or perhaps smoking or, or whatever the behaviour might be. For any one individual, they feel ambivalent about it because there's some things they like about it and some things they don't about it. And the, the difficulty is that um, while the client might be feeling or patient might be feeling ambivalent, on the other side we have clinicians who often experience what we call the writing reflex. The writing reflex is this notion whereby um, the clinician you know, wants to make things right for the person, you know, wants to fix things, can see in the future there's some sort of um, you know, perhaps bad outcome or, or some you know, consequence for them and wants to set that aright. The problem is that where on the one hand we have the, cl the client with ambivalence and on the other hand we have the uh, clinician with the writing uh, reflex, a confrontation occurs between those two. The ambivalence and the writing ref reflex confront each other and in the end uh, what that actually can do is to make the person more resistant to change and less likely to change. So faced with this dilemma, faced with this notion that we're wanting to help people to make changes um, to improve their, their health and their quality of life, but also this notion that, um, you know, that we're really wanting to avoid those arguments whereby the, uh, the client becomes more and more resistant of change, they, they developed some early concepts. And probably the first one is, is a really important take home message from all of this. And, and that is that um, we're really wanting the client rather than the clinician to be making the arguments for change. That's a fundamental kind of element of, of what we're now trying to do when, when working with our, with our clients. Our role is actually much more just about evoking from the clients their own concerns and, and their own motivations. Um, rather than trying to tell them what to do or persuade them about what to do, we're trying to evoke it from them and have them argue for change themselves. As well as that, we, we want to do that um, in a way where we listen with empathy, have, have an empathic kind of ear to, to what the client is having to say. We want to minimise resistance. We want to, to, to work with people in a way where they um, uh, are arguing less and less against change or are resisting change in that way. And we're wanting to nurture hope and optimism. We want to create a sense of, of optimism um, that things can change for them. So out of those early concepts, I guess, was developed this uh, approach called motivational interviewing. Um, motivational interviewing, I, I guess if we're thinking of a definition, motivational interviewing is goal-directed in that it is about trying to work towards change and work towards, um, you know, uh, healthy behavioural changes. But it's also client-centred in that while there are these goals and we're working towards something, we're wanting to do it in a way whereby, you know, we're evoking that from the clients. It's, it's evoking their choices and their strategies and their goals. We do those things in order to elicit some sort of behaviour change for the client um, by helping them to explore and resolve ambivalence. So while ambivalence is there and, and is something that we're not wanting to, to sort of argue against, we recognise that it's there and we try to explore it and ultimately resolve it for the person so they're able to make their own personal choice.